everyone. Welcome to today's webinar with RecycleSmart. I am Leila, one of the campaign managers here at Birdshow. And just before we get started, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land I'm based on today. Birdshow is based on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and we pay our respects to the elders past, present, and emerging. Birdshow is working with RecycleSmart on a crowdsourced funding offer. The information and discussion this today is for informational purposes only and should not be considered as financial advice or as a recommendation to invest. Please always consider the offer document and the general CSF warning before investing. It's all going to be available on Birchow.com. Now, how today's session is going to run. First, I'm going to give a quick introduction of Birchow, but I'm very aware that you're not here to see me. So I'm going to pass the ball very quickly. Giorgio and the team is going to take us through a presentation of the business that's going to take around 20 minutes or 30 minutes. And we'll talk about how the idea came about, numbers that they have achieved so far, and the plans that they have after the race. Then we're going to switch to a Q&A session. So if you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen right now, you see a little Q&A bubble. If you have any question during today's session, please pop it in the Q&A box and we'll answer at the end. Lastly, we are recording this session. So if you have to jump off, uh, we're going to send a report afterwards. Before I introduce Giorgio and the team, we realized that we have a lot of new investors jumping in. So first, welcome. And we'd love to quickly explain what Bircho does and and why we think this, this webinar is relevant. We believe that everyone should have the opportunity to invest in the brands that they love. And we know that it's very hard to have access to these companies. Normally they go to big investment firms and we, the everyday people that buy from them, that believes in them, we don't have the chance of investing in the early stage of the business before they actually go global. Virtual is Australia's leading CSF platform. We have over 70% of market share since 2020. And since 2018, when we started, we hosted over 250 successful offers just like this one, facilitated over $200 million in investment. Right now, you probably noticed that we have an EOI open, and I'll explain what is the difference between the EOI that you obviously you cannot invest now. It means that we're targeting the market. We're considering all the information that is out there, and the team is working really hard to chat in with investors, defining the minimum and maximum target, defining a, a right valuation for this round. And once they have all of this information ready, which is going to be around next week, this is when we open the offer phase. So then you can make an investment decision. You're going to have all of the information before you decide if you're going to invest or not in the company. But today's session is going to help you to give a high level understanding of it and what the team is going to do next. Uh, we are going to send as well all the information about how do you make an investment? How do you use the platform? How can you invest over $10,000. If you have any further questions on that, just pop it in the Q&A and I'm going to answer you personally as well. That's it for me. I'm very happy to introduce you to Georgia. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm George, uh, still of Recycles, man. I'm just going to take a few seconds to introduce the panelists and the team today here. Uh, you will see, I'm just, just looking at the, at the list over here. We have um, Marco, my co-founder, and our CTO, our technical uh, technical uh, expert. Um, we have Mark, our advisor. So Mark is helping us um, uh, looking into numbers and strategy for the business. Eugenie, our chief growth officer. So she looks into anything about uh, marketing, sales, and customer care. We have Justin, another advisor of ours. Justin is an industry expert. So Justin used to work for a very large um, waste company as a chief strategy officer. And uh, last but not least, we have um, Fred Olive, our CFO, and uh, my business partner for many years, and Ricky. Ricky is our head of operations. So Ricky is the one that does all the magics and coordinates all of our drivers across Australia, now more than 60 of them. All righty, so I would love to take you guys through a quick deck to show you what we are doing. Um, and after that, uh, we're going to go into a Q&A session where you can ask any, any questions about the business. Let me just share the, um, the deck with you, how it oh, should work now. All right. So we've been called the fastest growing, the fastest growing company in Australia. Um, we've been growing twice since last year. Let me just go over the next deck. So. It all started very simple. It all started with actually me and Marco trying the service in Randwick in the eastern suburbs of Sydney. 
uh, on a scooter. So it was um, very early days. Uh, we were collecting bags on, on a Vespa and we we're just trying the service. We went to the Antler program. Uh, Antler is a venture fund out of, um, out of Singapore. They have a, a Sydney office now. And they were the first ones that invest in our idea in July 2019. We uh, we hit two main uh, milestones today. One of them is that we raised with Bircher last year, a year ago, 12 months ago, $1 million. And the other one is that now uh, we went from, you know, myself driving a tiny scooter around uh, Sydney to having more than 60 drivers across Australia. The problem is quite simple. Recycling is in a really critical situation. It's very hard to understand what happens. Um, we It's complicated. People put wrong, wrong items into the wrong bins. You got batteries into, into bins that start fires. You have might have seen some of these advertising on, um, on, on waste trucks. And, uh, and it's costing the government and us as a society millions of dollars. So having the wrong items in the bin is really expensive and it's just really wrong, right? So recycling, it's, um, it's, it's highly frictional. So it's inconvenient. You really don't know what to do with it. It's time consuming. Uh, you honestly have between five and 10 seconds in front of a bin to decide what to do with an item. It's confusing, different rules, different councils, it's, it's, it, and, it's, and the issue of bar contamination, segregation. So actually mixing stuff in the same bin and putting the wrong items creates a lot of issues for, for us, for everyone actually, for the society. We collect four major streams of waste, soft plastics, clothes, e-waste, and everything else. Soft plastics is pretty much anything you can scrunch up. Clothes is anything you can wear, including accessories, shoes, uh, and so on. And we include in that bucket textiles as well, right? Manchester, towels, and so on. E-waste is anything with, with electricity. And then we have everything else that is a long list of items, which I would love to give you a show about. So, we have things like coffee pots, polystyrene, X-rays, uh, blister packs, batteries, of course, household batteries, tin of paint, hands, uh, books. We donate them, actually. We have toys, uh, bobs. Uh, uh, that's, that's actually um, a base, a pot for plants. And the list is much longer than this, but it gives you an idea. It's a list of wrong, like not wrong, but like a list of weird items you never know what to do with. So between these for these four buckets, these four uh, type of, of waste, we're talking about 30 to 40% of your daily waste production, which is a lot of stuff. They currently go either in landfill or uh, you're supposed to go somewhere with it, but very few people actually care about it. We serve three major channels um, with our solution. So we have a B2C solution, a B2B solution, and a B2G solution. Let me explain you what it is. B2C, it's consumer. So it's you and your house booking a pickup. Uh, you pay $7 per bag and we come collect the bag for you. B2B are large businesses. We work with large organizations and we usually collect in bulk. Um, if you have a small office of five people, it's still a bag. Otherwise, we collect per bin. And then the government. So the councils are offering, some councils are offering a free service to the members. So they pay per bag to make sure that residents have access to a free collection as well as we service councils' warehouses, like drop-off locations, so-called community recycling centers, where people can go drop off their items, and we are the one actually servicing the bin, taking these items away and making sure that they get recycled properly. How does it work? It's quite simple. You pack your bag, you put everything together in the same bag. It can be one of our beautiful pink bags, which you can buy on our website, or actually any bag you have at home, any grocery shop bag that you would use at Woolies or, or Coles or so on. You do not need to sort them out. You can just chuck them all together in a single in a single bag. Then you book a pickup uh, on our app. It's just up exactly as Uber. So you have, we have an app where you can just go online, book a pickup for any day um, from, you know, after the close time is 4 p.m. So if it's after 4 p.m. is the next, the following day. Otherwise, it's, you know, 3 p.m. is for the day after. Otherwise, it's for the day, for the days after that. And we do the rest. So one of our drivers will come to your place, uh, pick up the bag in front of your door, measure the weight, record the type of items into an application. So making sure that we know what's inside, take a picture of it and, um, and uh, empty, and then empty the bag in the own car. So divide all the items. 
and making sure that they they have um, some sort of a uh, bucket uh, system where, where we use, which we use, and uh, they're gonna divide all of these items in the car and make sure that it's sorted. They will return the bag in front of your door after that. How big is the industry? Well, we're talking about a very large industry. If you think about it, everyone is um, it's a client. So it's a $15 billion business in Australia and it's a $1 trillion, glo $1 trillion globally. Uh, we're talking about the rest of the world. And uh, we can dig into the financials later, but we believe we have a $100 million opportunity in a $15 billion market. Just a tiny, tiny slice of the industry would already be a very large opportunity for us. Our attraction to date, we have 71, we're working in 71 different areas of Australia uh, across most of the country. We are launching in, in, in the mix. So we are already are in Adelaide, Melbourne, Brisbane, Sydney, uh, Newcastle, and a bunch of other regional locations. And we're going to expand to WA, Tasmania, and um, WA, Tasmania, and Canberra by, by August this year. At the moment, we're tracking on $2 million in our recurring revenue. And we have 29,000 uh, users that use our apps uh, on, uh, on, uh, to, to book a pickup. We have uh, almost 500,000 pickups booked to date and 800 tons of, um, of waste diverted from landfill, which is a great, a great result. We work with very large organizations. We work with big brands that are doing co-marketing for us. And we work with charities that are, um, for example, like Aussie Harvest, right? Where we donate the food that we collect from your house that is not being, uh, not being um, used. Like if you have packaged food that is almost expiring, or that you don't need anymore, you can donate it and make sure that someone in need receives it. We're working with Quantas Freight. So we are recycling all the packaging, most of the packaging for Quantas Freight. Um, we are donating clothes to the Australian Red Cross. We are doing uh, business or office pickups from Google and Canva and so on. So we actually are already working with a bunch of brands out there. The team that I introduced to you, uh, so this is the core, the core leadership team. Uh, each one of us has significant experience in our own field. Um, but yeah, happy to dig into this later if you want to know a bit more about us. And we have two advisors, one with a deep industry understanding. So he knows the industry really, really well. And I love Justin to take over a couple of minutes after my presentation to give you an understanding of the industry and how we fit into it. And Mark, which has been around uh, startups for a very long time and understands the mechanics in how to raise capital and how to run and to scale a startup. We have great, um, great reviews from uh, people using the service. As you can see, a bunch of them left a great uh, feedback on Google, as well as our, um, our clients, our business clients, such as Dan from Canva, which have been using the service now, I think, for almost three years are quite happy with what, what we do. Just to highlight three types of collaboration that we already worked on. And we have a few others coming up in the pipeline, very exciting ones, but these ones already happened. So Manly Spoon is a major uh, food box provider. So you receive at home a box full of things you can cook together. We're working with their own office. So we're collecting items from, the, from their own office and we did the cross-marketing activity with them. Ozarvest, as mentioned before, we are donating them uh, all the food that is being packaged food that's being uh, given by our users um, and then council. So we're servicing council series C, not just providing the service to their users, but as well servicing their own drop-off location. The council you see up here is with Jacaribi and a news that I just got this morning from Toj, our sales head of sales, is that Eurobodala in South New South Wales is going to use us for CC services as well. There's a long list of them already doing it, but we just got a couple that just happened in the last week and we felt it was great to highlight the success with you guys. This is uh, Mark and Fred expertise, um, but basically high level, we're targeting to double the revenue in the next, uh, in the uh, by the end of this year, of this calendar year, and to uh, achieve break even in 12 months from now. Um, we want to keep the operations quite lean. We're sitting at 20 of these at the moment. We're targeting 30 at scale. Uh, so really leveraging the tech part of our product to make sure we do not need too many people to run the business. And... Um, yeah, what is not because this is just considering us scaling up in Australia and not other additional things we could do, like looking at the overseas market 
or way to monetize what we collect, which we don't for now. We just charge for our, our last mile logistics, but we don't make any money out of waste. We just give it away for free. And we don't sell data yet. And if you think about it, we collect lots of data from what we do. We have a picture, geolocation, what's inside, type of waste, weight for each collection we do, which is a lot of information that could be eventually used one day by other stakeholders um, to improve what happens in the waste space. So as I said before, by December, we want to double our revenue. Um, two or three main things, right? So one is to add fuel to our growth engine. So we got a million dollar in July last year, and we added a million dollar revenue on top of it. So basically is the more money we get, the more we can scale up our revenue, which is great. Uh, support the geographical expansion. As I mentioned before, we're planning to open in the last three cities where we're not yet, WA, Tasmania, and uh, states, sorry. WA, Tasmania, and Canberra, and uh, ACT. And then it's clearly scaling up our growth tech uh, team to make sure we can deliver and we have the right infrastructure to service the growth that we're chasing. This is the news that came up this morning. I really wanted to share with you. Oh, we actually did this morning cross the half a million bags collected since we started. Half a million bags, it's a great number and I'm really uh, grateful to our team for delivering such a great result. So this is a great, it was actually perfect. <laughs> to receive it this morning, because it's it made my uh, last slide really easy to, to show today. Uh, thank you all. I just would love, Justin, if you can step in for a sec um, and just chat about how we fit into the overall industry, thanks to your expertise as the Chief Strategy Officer for Suez. Thanks, Giorgio, and hi, everyone. So Giorgio's talked about some pretty big numbers in terms of the size of the waste market, but if we turn that into actual volumes of waste, uh, the Australian waste market, it's basically 75 million tonnes of waste created in Australia, which is a huge amount. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, we're one of the most wasteful nations in terms of per capita waste. So it's about 2.9 uh, tonnes per capita, which is huge versus the rest of the world. Unfortunately, the infrastructure that uh, Australia relies upon is still very landfill dependent. And we're seeing a couple of energy from waste plants uh, being constructed, certainly on the west side of Australia, neither of which are up the, the waste hierarchy. So avoidance or reuse or even recycle. So you're getting the lowest um, benefit of that resource. The infrastructure is very much geared to disposal, not circular economy. And even the recycling infrastructure that is set up in the country is geared up for specific products. So if you think about the council that you are located in, I've, I've got a four bin uh, process. So blue for my paper and cardboard. I've got yellow for my co-mingled, which is bottles, both plastic and glass and aluminium, so cans. Uh, I have a small red bin, thankfully for landfill, and then have a green bin for gardening waste. It doesn't cater for all the other things, all the other items that are in your household, from soft plastics to toys to batteries, which do cause huge issues in the waste industry from both uh, vehicle fires, but also facility fires, which then again impacts the throughput of circular economy. And then you've got a lack of standardization and harmonization across all states and all councils. So if you actually look at the, the curbside standards across the country, it's a patchwork quilt of, of difference. So it's confusing for the end user to know what to put in which bin. And that's really where Recycle Smart come in to provide a solution. I'm not just an advisor, I'm a customer. Uh, I use Recycle Smart for my batteries, I use it for my uh, soft plastics, and I, I feel good about it, right? So the B2C offering is really there and you're seeing the first adopters who are sustainably minded, but you know, re references from friends, most of my friends are doing it now because of word of mouth. B2B, there's legislative tailwinds happening. So you're having circular economy strategies implemented by different governments. ACT have already put theirs in for 2024, um, New South Wales, uh, more measures coming in 2025. These things are, or these legislation and policy changes really support what Recycle Smart are trying to do. And the B2B offering enables um, small businesses to get on board uh, and start to get ahead of the policy changes that are coming. And then the B2G, so the, the, the business to government or councils offering is already being well uh, received. 
and councils are vying to to compete to show who can be the most sustainable. So those three areas are really leading Recycle Smart to uh, a, a good future, I would suggest, in terms of all those items that just aren't catered for with the infrastructure that's set up, but with the goals that both federal and state government are setting, uh, they can be really part of a solution to take like I say, a relatively small share of the waste market in Australia to generate some significant uh, revenue for the business. Thank you. Thank you, Justin and Georgia. This is super insightful. Justin, I have a question on that. You mentioned that the B2B and obviously that, that's a new offering. Last year, when you guys were in virtual, uh, you were just in Sydney and now you're in New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia and Queensland. You had just a B2C offer and now you have the B2B offer as well. You doubled the impact and the revenue in just one year, which is really impressive. Was it always the plan? So you're kind of just waiting for the capital to come in in order to start the B2B offer or you, this opportunity just came up last year? I'm happy to take it, Eugenie. Um... So yeah, it was the plan, right? So we started as a B2G business. So basically having councils um, supporting our service, it was the easiest way to get to the first million dollar in revenue because councils are long-term secure, almost secure uh, clients for a very long time. So that's how we started. We test the service, we get up there, but then we realized that the potential was opening B2B and direct B2C, people paying for the service as well to make sure we could uh, grow the way that uh, is needed because the government moves a bit slower in that sense. So yes, it was the plan and that's why we raised money last year. That's what we said we were going to do and we did it. So yes. Uh, I think you can stop sharing your screen now if that's okay. Jennifer asked a question if Justin was referring to his live deck. No, he wasn't. It's just a Q and a now, but thanks for, for asking them. Uh, cool. The first question, Kim left a long answer about what was the, the concert response about Recycle Smart? And I'm gonna give you a chance to read this afterwards and contact this investor personally if you like. But are you in conversations with the ACT's government as well and the concert? Is that a plan to go there to expand there this year? I go for it, Eugenie. Yeah. Because Eugene is the one coordinating the questions, but I'm happy to take it. Yes, we're talking to the city government. Yes, we apply for all the paperwork that we need to have, and we're planning to launch the first of June. Yeah. Um, yes, and just like the, the question is quite it's quite specific and it raises a few points around the impact that we have on the recycling rate um, and the fact that we're not uh, recycling at the, ourselves. So maybe we can answer that as well. Um, I'll just draft a. a Brief answer, and then Georgia, if you want to jump in, feel free to jump in. Um, so the, our impact on the recycling rate, we've actually had a, a recent study uh, in one of the buildings we are um, collecting from, which actually show that our service obviously divert more well, waste from landfills because people are able to have a doorstep solution for these items that are tricky to recycle. But also what was interesting to note was that they really measured a decreased contamination of the recycling bin. Um, because people had a solution for those items instead of you know, instead of just doing some wish cycling and throwing some plastics in the yellow bin, for example. And um, they also um, observed an increase in the use of the other recycling bin, just as a kind of a, a virtual effect of the use of our service. So I would say that um, we do have an impact on the recycling rates overall. Um, we do appreciate as well the con combination of our service from doorstep collection, but also recycling center collection to like uh, increase the reach of our service. Um, for people who are willing to go to a recycling center when it's available, we can make more items available there for recycling. Um, and lastly, around the point of um, our service not actually recycling directly, um, I'm sure we'll come to that in a second because I've seen a few other questions on that. Um, but we do partner with vetted recyclers and they are placed all around Australia. And yes, unfortunately, at this stage, there's not many recyclers based in ACT, which is quite a narrow territory. Um, and so that's why we're taking the we will take the recyclables to Victoria or New South Wales, most likely. Really well answered. Kim, let us know if that answers your question. Otherwise, just pop another one, please. Um, with all these hard recycle items, what is the company doing with them? Handing over to Ricky. Ricardo. 
Hello, everyone. Sorry, I'm just at the warehouse today, so if you hear some background noise, you, you know what it is. Uh, but yes, as um, Eugenia already kind of briefly answered to this, um, so we take every, everything we collect on a daily basis uh, comes to our consolidation points. This is where we make sure they're all sorted and organized properly. And then when we have like, uh, you know, uh, commercially viable amounts to ship them over to <coughs> Uh, our partner recyclers that's uh, that's what we do and that's how they get uh, recycled uh, properly so we are literally as mentioned before we are that uh, link we don't recycle ourselves uh, but that's not um, that's not a bag that's a feature so that's how we basically get to transport these items to the recyclers which otherwise they would have no way to to get them because everything would go into just uh, just the curbside bins thank you that answers Fun fact is that Ricardo and I worked together four years ago, maybe five, and I knew Georgia for a long time ago as well. So I'm kind of a bit of a cheerleader for the company. It's a very um, small world, isn't it? It is a very small world. Um, next question. Edward is asking, where does the profit comes from? You have the fees from the individuals, the businesses, the government, or from selling the recycled material. Yes, thank you, Eugenie. So we make money at the moment only of the last mile logistics. We charge per bag, $7 per bag, pretty much, plus GST, pretty much everyone. Users, B2C, B2B, and uh, government, the councils. We have discounts on bulk collections, so very large collections, we do have a cheaper price. But otherwise, we tend to stick to the $7 per bag, meaning every 40 liter of waste, we charge uh, $7. We do not make money yet out of sending waste, um, we have streams where we pay a tiny bit, streams where we make a little bit of money, just they offset each other. So overall, we're making no money out of other waste oh. at the moment. At the moment. Um, are you open to share this deck with investors afterwards? We had a, a question about that. Uh, absolutely, unless there is anything against it. But no, they should not? be fine. So yeah. after is I'm going to send a recording to the team so they can share with you guys in an email um, alongside the deck. Sounds good. Are you affiliated with a pre-existing Canadian business called Recycle Smart? And any no, we're not. Oh, no, we're not. Sorry, sorry, go for it. Uh, and, and the second part of this question is yeah. any potential for a cease and disease against Recycle Smart P2I? So Recycle Smart Canada came to us years ago, to me and Marco. Uh, we, we had the dot-com for 10 years uh, because we tried a few different things using the same name. So they came to us just before we launched again in 2019, the new program, and they offered to buy us the website, which we didn't sell. So no, we don't have any issue with that. Recycle Smart Canada was sold as well to another player, and I think they're retiring the brand anyway. So I'm in contact with the former C CMO. We had a few chats because of the of the of the of this website and actually at some stage this is up to a year ago we were receiving their own customer care emails because people were going to .com and saying hey i have this issue here or there so we were forwarding them their own emails as a favor so no you're a good competitor a... good person oh well, it's a different type of they were doing a normal bean collection it was a different business okay hope that answers the question christopher can you understand if you knew the other Recycle Smart and then you came to this race or was the opposite way? So you're like looking for the Australian version and then you came across the Canadian business. Just curious. No, no, no. They started after us. We bought the name started of the website after. five years before they started. Yeah, we were the first. Cool. We had a question about customer privacy. So the investor is saying, I will be concerned about customer privacy if there would be a move towards selling data. Are there any further details on your plans to monetize the data? And how would you um, de-identify that? This is Marco. I think that's a really great question for Marco, actually. Yeah, happy to answer. Of course, uh, um, the data, are, there's no intention absolutely to give away any user information to the data. So uh, there is, uh, in the industry, there is definitely a lack in terms of uh, understanding of what uh, uh, the industry, I mean, I mean, so the, the general public is actually doing with waste. So we have the opportunity to really enrich uh, the council knowledge, 
and improve uh, I mean the the industry overall with uh, the information that we are collecting of course I mean Jojo was mentioning that we are collecting uh, a lot of data which it is the case but none of them of course are like it's gonna be like get shared with any private privacy information everything gets collated everything gets like sort of plotted down to come up with insights that then can be sort of reutilized and and leverage like at the industry level so nothing of course can be reconducted to any 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 user but like i mean the value of this data is uh, is uh, socially and of course also like uh, i mean say business wise uh, very very relevant mm. hope it makes sense marco is it possible to de-identify this data 100 yeah yeah, yeah. okay 100%. thank you um really good question you have done a race previously by a virtual how did you find the experience and why are you choosing to do another CSF round instead of the most traditional funding? I guess uh, that's for me and Mark, maybe you can step in as well to comment, but we found the experience actually with you guys really, really good. That's why we're back. We're back for more. Uh, there's two reasons why to do a crowdfunding round for a brand like ours. We actually are not just getting funds, but we're getting more people using the service. So there is a bit of a branding, building, exercise done as well through our CFF. And the second bit is, um, Mark, do you want to chuck in why from uh, funding? Mark, do you want to comment on it, on the second part? Sure. Um, look, I, th I think we had a really successful raise last year. Uh, it was a great process, but both from the virtual team and from all of the investors. Um, like Giorgio said, uh, the exposure and the uptake uh, to launch or to get the B2C um, part of the business off the ground uh, was immense. And it was really helpful going through the, the marketing campaign uh, for the CSF round. Um, and it just enabled us to, to, to scale uh, across the country. Um, so we chose to do it again this year. There's a very relevant point because every B2B offer of service has also a person in the end of it right so we're all consumers even if you have a company even if you're a founder and you're gonna engage with recycle smart through your business you still are a customer in the end of the day and people cannot use you if they don't know about you Leila, i'll just add to that that a lot of the people i spoke to on last year on the campaign were business owners that were desperate to use the service and asking when we were gonna uh, be operating in their area there you so go. it was very encouraging Thank you, the answers. Some of your services are covered by other retailers, so such as Battery through Offsworks. How are you addressing the competition? Uh, Becky, do you need it? <laughs> Thank you, so um, we, yeah, Go for it. <laughs> Okay. Um, yeah, no, that's, that's a really interesting question as well. Um, so we um, we offer a doorstep collection service. So we offer that extra convenience for people to actually be able to put these items all together in a bag, not having to sort it in a thousand different boxes or tubes at home, just using the one shopping bag or two actually, um, and then being able to recycle them without going around town. So that's kind of the um, difference that our service um, has as a value. Obviously it comes with a price, except in the counties where we're partners but this is um, through convenience that we kind of like address this competition uh, and again I think the recycling issue is so big in Australia that we, we need more than one solution so it's obviously also great that there are some public drop-offs available for people who can think about taking their pens with them when they go to office works I personally forget 100% of the time so that's why I'm using recycling smart and if I can comment on it we already have service in public drop-off anyway so it's almost like you can choose to go uh, to a public drop-off. If it's council, we might be the ones servicing that drop-off. Or if you prefer to have, um, you know, a comfortable and easy service at home, that's that's ours too. So, yeah. Eugene, I'm curious to know if there's any country that is referenced in recycling now, because obviously it's a massive problem in Australia and you guys are addressing that. But is there any country that kind of everybody looks at them in order to get a good reference? Mm -hmm. Not really. Uh, well, the Nordics are always the most advanced in recycling, but the way they've done that is really through um, people participation. So there are lots of different bins um, at home, in the buildings, mm -hmm. um, and it's sorted from the source. Um, yeah, that's not really the way it's working. It's working. And the education so. piece that happened with them over the years. 
Is there any plans for you guys to expand overseas? Georgia? Yes. So we're definitely looking at Australia first. Mm -hmm. uh, New Zealand will be our, you know, the step after that will make sense. And then I guess it's a question of what we really want to do. Do we want to raise a lot of money from VCs and go to the US? Or or not. It's it's a question that will come probably in a couple of years. Mm -hmm. uh, New Zealand will be almost like adding another state. We're already looking into the market, but it's not really overseas, right? It's more of like a domestic, um, a domestic market, if you want. It's interesting to see that it's a global problem and nobody could tackle that so far. So definitely a good opportunity for you guys. Someone is asking about the target amount, which I can probably answer at the beginning of the question. So we're still finalizing the details on that, we're going to have a minimal and a maximum target, depending on a series of factors that we're all sitting down and studying that together. But you're going to know all the information when the offer goes live next week. But I think what we, you can answer on this answer, on this question is, what would be your short-term and long-term goals for the funds? Georgia, yeah. Yeah, so... Um... Uh, short term, meaning what we're going to do with the money, right? Short term. And I think that's what was in the deck before. That is basically um, expanding across Australia, so penetration in the local market, uh, building our tech team and uh, and uh, try to try a different, uh, add different service to our product portfolio, right? So add probably a different other things we can collect. Um, I think that's the answer, isn't it? Mark? So, it, it, well, I'd, I'd also add, it's, it's important to highlight that... Um, you know, we raised a million dollars last year and with that million dollars, we actually doubled uh, the company's revenue. So added another million dollars of revenue um, to, to the company. So there's now, um, I guess the growth engine of the company is proven. So um, it, it's quite clear on how we can use additional funding to to, to further in, increase revenue going forwards. Um, and that's through the, you know, the, 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 the points that Giorgio's covered, but we have a proven growth engine now uh, having used the the raise amount last year, doubling revenue, and um, we believe we can continue to 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 do that in the next twelve and and eighteen months. Beautiful, thank you. Lisa is saying congrats on the success so far. What is the current revenue split between B two C, B two B, and B two G, and how are the margins different in between them? And she is also a current investor. Uh, I guess I can take it. And Fred, if I'm wrong with the numbers, please jump in. But my understanding is we have 55 to 60 percent. It's B2G government councils. Then we have uh, so 60. Then we have a 25 percent of B2B businesses and 15 percent of B2C or on our overall uh, revenue base. And the other number of our uh, margins at the moment, we have margins are quite similar across the three, uh, I, I can share the overall margin. That is 40% uh, gross margin on drivers. And then it's a 25% operating margin. I think it's actually a bit above that. <clears throat> Maybe 45 and 29 mark. But it's, uh, yeah. the, uh, the gross margins from, from March were 48%. Wow. Thank you. Um, how do you pay your drivers? The investor wants to ensure sustainability and ethics. Uh, I will say, well, Eugenie, I don't know if you're still there, but I, I can take it. Uh, and you can jump in or Fred, whoever wants to jump in. But basically, we pay our driver per task, right? We pay our driver per task. We have an algorithm that makes sure they are reward in the right way. And I would say they are paid above market rates, so above what other services like Uber would do. Uh, so, yes, definitely it's sustainable. It's it's good money. And uh, there is an algorithm that makes sure they make enough, right? So otherwise, they won't work for us. So I would almost say that now the gig economy market is so mature that if you do not offer a great pay, people choose to work with someone else because they can work for Uber, they can work for uh, you know a bunch of other uh, services out there. So you need to be competitive. True. Eugene, do you want to add to that? Yeah, just just one thing, not not really um, numbers focused, but we are we are the chance to have like had some drivers who've been working for us for years now um, and they're really passionate about what they do um, and yeah I think maybe like Ricky if you want to say something but it's a really tight-knit team there too um, and I think it's also a great testament to that right that we're paying the right amount. Thank you. Did you bring this model from overseas that anyone doing Recycle Smart overseas? 
No, Marco and myself were stupid enough to play on this for 15 years. <laughs> and that's what came out of it. So no, it's actually our idea. And it has been on the making since 2010. So for, for a few years. Oh. It's, not, it's not a copycat. <laughs> we will call it an inspiration, not copycat. But if you haven't, that's good. And, and Mark, if you want to jump in about the idea, since you've been suffering through all of this, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> cool. Jenny asked a really good question, and I, I have this question as well. I feel that there's a, le a serious lack of customer confidence in recycling at the moment due to things like the red cycle issues. How transparent is Recycle Smart in terms of where and how the items are recycled, especially soft plastics? That's a really good question. I can see we have a, a few along those lines, obviously, um, and that's completely relevant. So for soft plastics and also for all the other items, as Ricky was mentioning it earlier, so we're working with a, a network of vetted recyclers. Um, we're trying our best to answer the first part of the question um, in terms of transparency to show um, through our social media, our newsletter, all the content we create um, to show what exactly happens to the items we collect. Um, we also share uh, reports with our users directly in their account, whether they're B2B, B2C, or B2G, they can see their impact on how much uh, waste we have collected for them and, and dropped off at our um, recycling partners. Um, then we also have um, contracts in place, uh, at least agreements in place with our, our recyclers um, so that they can confirm that they are going to be able to recycle the quantities that we're giving to them. Um, and we're checking in with them regularly so we can make sure that the second some of our uh, recycling partners can't accept any more quantities, then that's something that we need to stop collecting on our end as well. Um, and the, the last thing I would add, and then I'll let uh, Ricky jump in if I've forgotten anything, um, is that the, the tech team has also been working on what we call internally the traceability feature, which enables us to, um, to track all the um, movements uh, internally and externally. So all the things that are coming in our consolidation points and when and where they are coming out from our consolidation points to the different recyclers. Uh, and that's a feature that we really want to enhance as well because it's important for us. It's also very important for our business partners. That is really cool. I didn't know about this feature. Uh, Taz is asking any thoughts on bird-proof pickup bags? That's a really good one. An aluminium box. Um, uh, yeah, I, unfortunately, not really. We do have this issue uh, coming up, not that regularly, but I've heard it um, already from customer service. We, um, we always advise our customers to leave their bags in a secure place. Um, as much as they can. Um, if there are too many birds swooping around, we'll recommend to keep them inside um, and then be there the day of our driver comes in. But um, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Mark is saying there are over 4,000 waste management companies. Is consolidation likely or does that factor for RecycleSmart? I'm happy to take this one as well. So yes, definitely is a factor. We're already spoke, speaking to the two major, three major waste player companies in Australia. Uh, and I believe there will be a question we're going to have probably in three years from now. Once we are, you know, the product we're offering is new, right? It's different from anyone else. And it's growing the right way. So we think that once we achieve, you know, some sort of a market expansion that makes some sense, uh, one of the options could be, you know, eventually um, selling the business to someone else, a larger company, or going overseas. That's probably the question that we're going to have in two, three years from now. Georgia, a question that you're very used to get. Can you tell us what you do with soft plastics? What do I do with soft plastics? Yeah. Myself? I <laughs> Uh, no, what we do is we partner with now two different uh, providers. So after what happened with Recycle, which we all know is actually a sad story, uh, the service was stopped in November 2022. Um, the government really pushed a lot of different players to create some sort of processing plants that they can process the plastics uh, in different ways. Uh, because we only do collection, we do not do, um, we don't do um, processing. We can always change and use the best available solution at the moment on the market, which now is uh, two different companies uh, that we're working with. They're doing different things. One of them is melting it into oil, stock feed oil again. 
the other one is creating furniture and is creating bitumen uh, asphalt um, out of it, components for the asphalt out of it. So that's what we do. Thank you, that answer. And, and we can always change, right? So if anything better comes to market, we can change it. But I have to say that since Red Cycle came, uh, debacle happened, um, lots of uh, companies came up with new solutions. NDP has been really pushing them to do the right thing. So the market really changed a lot. Thank you. Tom is saying that this is a great concept. Do you have any way of minimizing the vehicle emissions? He says that he works, he lives in a regional area and he worry that much of your good work can be undone. Um, Sorry, Eugenie. <sighs> you want to take it? I would love to. Um, okay. First, we need to remember that for all of the items we collect, you should go somewhere with your car, driving somewhere by yourself and drop them off. The fact that one driver does for 28 different people, it's already a great uh, reduction of carbon emission because you're not supposed to use your bin. Putting batteries in your bin is dangerous and the calcium doesn't want you to do. So we already are consolidating that. That said, uh, we, uh, and Eugenie can dig into it, but we are, um, uh, Eugenie, <laughs> carbon so, yeah. Um So two things um, on top of that, uh, we, um, we have developed an optim optimizer tool um, that optimizes the routes of the drivers, making sure that we are um, they always are taking the most uh, optimized itinerary to reduce their e own emissions. Um, just to answer specifically on the question of rural areas, um, it's even more optimized, right? We might just only go there on specific days to make sure that we um, we optimize these um, these routes. And lastly, as Georgia was um, saying, we are also um, a carbon neutral organization, so we are offsetting our emissions, but obviously it's not as good as uh, minimizing them from the beginning. That's why we we have both approach, right? We minimize minimize through optimization, and we also offset all the remaining emissions um, through our partner Trace. Amazing, thank you. Where is the mature processed? Does it stay in Australia? I'm happy to take this one because we went to that one uh, yesterday, basically. But yeah, we do collect. We only use companies based in Australia to to collect our items that what we have. Uh, and I think everything except some un unwearable textiles are all processed in Australia, except unwearable textiles, which is through a company that Eugenie might dig into the details, but yeah, that's the only thing that doesn't, is not processed in Australia at the moment. Yeah, that's correct. Um, we for the uh, unwearable textile, we work with a ISO certified company um, who process it in uh, Malaysia, um, and that's why at, that's the reason why is because at the moment there is no um, major recycling facility for end of life textiles that are not reusable in Australia. Beautiful. Julia is asking if the drivers kind of get all of this material, take to a central hub, and then redistribute from there. How does the customer know their items are repurposed or processed correctly, not just stuck in the landfill? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, it's kind of along the lines of um, what we answered earlier too. Um, so we we guarantee that through two things, right? I would say uh, one, uh, we have a very specific training for our drivers. Um, they go through a selection process. Um, they are trained. Um, so then we make sure that, that everything that they collect is actually dropped off at the right location. Um, so that would be one. And then to ensure that everything uh, coming out of our warehouse doesn't end up in landfill, then it goes back to the network of our vetted recyclers we're working with and how we track um, the movements of uh, materials in and out of a consolidation point. Thank you. Uh, there's an investor saying, sorry, I got distracted by a phone call. Can you briefly explain how do you actually make money? We make money by charging uh, uh, customers, either the government, businesses, or people for last mile logistics. As I said before, we charge $7 for each bag, around 40 days we collect. We have a 40% margin on drivers. So out of the $7, we still have 40% after our drivers collected. And after you take off all the cost of our warehouses, we still have a 25% margin. Thank you. John is saying, hi, Georgian team. First of all, I'm a customer, love what you're doing. And as a potential investor, what steps are you taking to avoid the kind of collapse that killed Red Cycle? I will say, Eugenie, jump in if I'm, but I will say it's all about transparency and availability. So first, the market, as I said before, changed a lot since Red Cycle. DPA pushed players to have processing capabilities in Australia. 
there's like probably now five to seven players doing it. So there's not just one as before. And the second bit is the API has been asking every stakeholder, including us, to be fully transparent of what happened, when it happens, not stocking in warehouses for a long time, and so on. So there's a lot of rules that were put in place after the debacle, which are actually making the industry much, much healthier, to be honest. Eugene, would you like to add to that? Because there's a second part of this question as well, which is how would you market this excitement in your service to those who are not already converts? I'll take that one. Um, we think that so we're trying to make it um, as um, as fun and engaging as possible because we know recycling first, as well, as Georgia was saying at the very beginning of the presentation, is quite overwhelming, right? The rules are ever changing, that changing from a council to another, from a morning to another. Um, it's very complicated, even when you want to do the right thing. So that's why we're trying to make it as simple as possible with the concept of a bag where you can put as many items as we collect, which is over 100 items at the moment. Um, and then um, we, we're we trying to just make it, yeah, um, more fun and engaging through our content. On social media, uh, we are present on Instagram, on TikTok, on Facebook, really trying to talk about recycling to people where they are and where they consume content um, and make like snackable pieces to um, get them excited on like what exactly happens to the item, what items can you recycle or not, um, why it's important to recycle. Oh, you tried to do. Thank you. As you grow, how do you drive economies of scale with heavy reliance on this resource intensive model? I think Mark can answer that probably. Yeah. Mark, you know about scaling business? You know about the. I do, yes, and economies of scale. Well, yeah. I mean, there's. Um, obviously, per per pickup, we're we're heavily reliant on on drivers. Um, so that will have to scale as the business scales. Uh, I think we've touched upon, um, yeah, you know, having having uh, routes that are that are uh, efficient in terms of um, uh, uh, emissions. But as we get more and more customers, um, then those customers start to cluster. That makes, uh, obviously that reduces the time between pickups as well. Uh, so that then makes those drivers much more efficient. Um, then when we get to things like warehouses, obviously there's economies of scale there um, because we don't need a warehouse for every X amount of customers. We, we have to get a warehouse before we start in a certain area. Um, and then that obviously that has a lot of capacity for us to scale uh, into that single um, piece of um, uh, infrastructure. So there are uh, there's 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 big economies of scale um, as the company grows here. Thank you. Uh, we still have fifty one questions to go through, and we should be finishing the webinar. So I'm very happy to stay over if you guys are happy as well. Again, the recording is going to be sent around, but we want to make sure to answer all of you before we make a decision. How does a company growth rely on the processing power of the recyclers in Australia? Okay, so I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, we collect probably a tiny bit of what could be processed. So the issue is definitely not in the processing capabilities, but sits in the collection side. So there's not enough collection of good stuff to have enough volumes to process. Like it's just a fraction of what we could do. So it's the other way around. Interesting. Yeah. I, yeah. I would I would assume that that would be the problem as well. So it's interesting to see that it's not. The, the problem is the collection, not, not, the, not the processing. Yeah. Okay. How were you able to find recyclers for soft plastic when um, Red Smart couldn't? Not Red Cycle, not Red Smart. And um, as <laughs> I said before, it, it, it was a very different situation back then. It's not as simple as there were no recycler, right? It's a long story. Uh, it goes through bad management, bad luck, COVID, a few things happened there. Um, and anyway, now there are more than two, I think it's seven, as I said before, processes that process source. They can process the soft plastics. So definitely that's not an issue that we're facing at all. Mark, do you want to add on that? Um, yeah, I was just going to add uh, that at the time when Red Cycle did collapse, that was the end of uh, November. Um, and then by February the following year, we had found a solution in order to, to resume the collection of soft plastics. So, um, 
yeah, I, I, I'm not sure what was happening at Red Cycle, but we were able to to bypass Red Cycle as a as a as a solution and find our own um, uh, partnerships uh, to establish so that we could resume collecting soft plastics. Perfect. Uh, we have a lot of questions actually about Red Cycle. Have you considered working with industries like e-bike batteries? Maybe Ricky can take this one, no, Eugenie? I mean, we... Uh, yeah, Ian, um, sure. Ricky, go ahead. Here I am. Yes, uh, we are. And I was actually talking last week with our current uh, battery recycler to see if we could expand uh, the product there. So um it's definitely something we are working on and it's probably gonna come on at some point awesome. roman is asking about the minimum and maximum amount for the the investment offer we're gonna find out all of that next week so if you haven't done your eoi yet highly recommend you to go ahead and express interest so you have access to the offer before everybody else it seems like a sensible business model. What is the barrier for entry for the other major competitors? I can I can take this on maybe and jump in, guys. Um, so, but first of all, how we we had a couple of players up to last year that were challenging our space. Uh, at the moment, we are I would say by far the largest player in the market. Um, and uh, yeah, there's different layers, right? One is having partnerships with uh, processors. Second is having enough market share. Third is when you work with a currency, they usually tend to stick with the same player for some time. But definitely, you know, someone else could come in the market and 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 uh, and do it. The question is, how many Ubers do you think you're gonna have in Australia? Two, three, right? And how big is the industry anyway? How much space there is for people to really play with different solutions for their own waste? Uh, probably not huge, but yeah, Eugenie, you're probably better than I am on this question. But yeah, no, no, that was a great answer, Giorgio. Um, I would just add that the the way we uh, we protect ourselves is by being very agile. So as you've seen in the last year, we've expanded into new geographies, we've added new segments, um, so the businesses and then the the individuals directly. Um, we're constantly improving our product and really focusing on what our customers want. Um, and we believe that's our way to um staying ahead of the game. Beautiful. Simon saying, if the market is 50, it's a, it's a $50 billion market, why is RecycleSmart limited to $100 million? Because we're very humble. I could have put up the <laughs> half a billion dollar. Because I'm watching you. <laughs> so Simon, no, but yes, like, absolutely. It's $100 million. Like the, we, we, you know, As you know, we are, we, we, it's what we think we could do. And clearly, it's not a promise because it's, it's, that's how the industry works. But the industry is huge. Uh, and so the $100 million is basically based on um, just getting a very tiny slice of the market. It, it could be much bigger than that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Eleanor is asking, I don't understand how e-waste can be recycled. What happens to them after the collection? Ricky. Hello. Uh, yeah, good question. So we partner with different recyclers in different states um, at the moment. And but the 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 bottom line here is that basically it gets dismantled. So it's very intensive process. Um, all the plastics get recycled through the plastic stream. All the other metal and other materials get recycled separately. Um, and so that's basically how it's done. It's literally dismantling piece by piece, shredding, dismantling, and and so on. Yeah. Thank you, Ricky. We have a few questions about if you plan to ramp up the marketing campaign, if you plan to educate more people into how important it is to recycle, what are the plans regarding the marketing? Um, short answer is yes. <laughs> we would love to uh, to ramp up our marketing. Um, so far, we've relied a lot on um, organic uh, and word of mouth. 
uh, building really on our engaged base of customers when it comes to B2C. Um, so relying on the word of mouth, um, on our social media, and then um, on the council support as well for the councils we partner with. Uh, when it comes to B2B, same, we've um, hosted webinars, we've used LinkedIn um, and direct outreach. Uh, we'd love to do more um, classic uh, borderline marketing campaigns, obviously. Um, but that means we need to have a little bit more money to invest there um, because we believe that we have a strong brand um, and definitely things to share out there. So um, the idea will be to be able to run a, a few marketing campaigns for the year uh, to help support um, the expansion, especially when we open new cities. Um, and that will, will be done through social media mainly, collaboration with influencers um, and local uh, press. Thank you. How much are you charging the companies to pick up recycling? So... Uh, Oh, sorry. Yeah. I mean, charging who? The the the, the people that the, the processors, as I said, we don't. Pay for it. So it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's I'll love for the investor to clarify the question. But the way I understood is, what is the B two B cost? So if a company the same as B two C, so it's always seven dollar per bag, or forty nine dollar for a very big bin, which is the same thing. So it's always seven dollar for forty liters of waste. The same, the same price. Let us know if that answers the question. Otherwise, we're happy to clarify as well. Uh, we had a note. And we don't pay to drop off items. So we only charge the user to do the logistics. Once we're in a warehouse, it goes off. There is a little cost here, but a little money here. So basically, cost free. Yeah, we don't pay and we don't pay for drop off. Just a, a little um, clarification for B2B. So yes, the, the, the base price is the same, but then obviously uh, because we also have a large scale collection service, um, then um, the, the price varies because it will really depend on the on the load that we have to take care of. Um, and that we definitely have volume discounts applying there too. Well, I had a question asking if you can share the willingness of big corporates and governments paying for the service. Do you feel that they were open to it saying, Thank God it was kind of the solution of our problems or are they still not very willing to pay for it? That's a really good question. Um, we'll say there's a bit of a mix uh, in there. So we do have very enthusiastic customers, uh, long time partners um, when it comes to councils um, who are really enthusiastic and um, jump on board the service directly. Um, and then we have more lengthy conversations with other um, governmental organizations or businesses even. So it, I think it's just as in life, right? There's all types of people and businesses out there. So thank you. Edwards, and I just want to note, I'm a driver who helps pick up recycling and then my wife and I are looking forward to investing when this round opens. I drive in my spare time for the love of the game because we really want to support this great service, which we found because we're looking for a soft plastic solution. Wonderful. Good to have you here. <laughs> Ed is asking, where do you see the most important and pressure, pressing avenues or how the new capital injection is going to be utilized? So a little bit going to the use of funds. That is what we discussed before. So I'm going to repeat it again. So it's scaling across Australia. So really getting the penetration in different markets where we're not, like the same as Sydney, I would say. Two is building the tech capabilities to make sure we have enough infrastructure to uh, keep up with the service that we're offering. And the third bit is to add more uh, products to our pipeline, to our offering. So increasing our product offering. Georgia, which segment do you think is going to be the largest profit? Is going to be the B2C, the B2B or B2G? No, I would say growth, not profit, because profit at the moment is exactly the same. Uh, in terms of growth, I think it's going to be B2B. That's the one that's been exploding since last year, uh, since July. So that is growing really fast. Mark? So, yeah, just to add to that, I mean, the growth uh, since last year has been over 450% in B2B and B2C. Uh, and out of those two, B2B is the one that's growing the fastest. Um, and definitely there's the most demand there um, from businesses, like I mentioned before, in terms of conversations I had last year during the campaign. But businesses are definitely the ones that want to get on board to do the right thing. Um, so that's the, the probably the highest highest uh, growth area for the, for the, for the company. Beautiful. We had a question about the benefits and perks for individual investors. So obviously, when you buy shares in the company, is expecting the company to grow and grow the valuation on the shares that you bought before. 
But would you like to touch base on the rewards that you're going to be offering? Yeah, sure. Um, so we will definitely be offering rewards for investors that will be relay, uh, linked to the amount of investment that you would like to uh, support us with. Um, and so we are still finalizing the details. Um, but yes, you answer one of the questions, there will definitely be some free power pickups involved there. Um, and the idea is just like to, yeah, to thank you for your investment um, and give you that extra little thank you gift. Yeah. Beautiful. Uh, we're having some questions about if this type of shares is kind of the same as buying on Comsec. Tom, it is not. This is more a long-term investment. I'm going to send you some more information now, but if that doesn't clarify, please let me know and I'll explain further. You mentioned $7 a bag, but the website states 15 for a two-bag pickup. Any plans to reduce or increase this pickup cost? So the, the price of the of the bag is actually eight. It is seven fifty when you book an on demand power pickup. It's seven dollar per bag when you jump on a plan, um, with a, a currently a promotion on the plan. So if you join, the first three months are only nine dollars ninety nine. Um, we uh, don't have any plans now to uh, increase or decrease the price. We'll just leave it as is, um, and see how that goes. Uh, but yeah, long term, our idea is to get um more partners as um and. Go governments to support um, our recycling efforts so that it becomes cheaper for the users. So whether through a partnership when the council subsidizes a free power pickup every now and then, or whether through a partnership with a big brand that might want to offer some credits to their user when they recycle their own tricky to recycle items, like for example, Nespresso for your coffee capsules. We had a question from Nancy that I think is a really good question. Is there anything that you planned for it last year that didn't work out? Georgia, you want to take this one? I don't think so. I think the only thing we changed was we postponed achieving break even. Uh, we were, but the reason is the growth was so big that we decided to keep fueling the growth engine instead of achieving profitability uh, quicker, break even quickly. So that's the only thing we didn't deliver on. We were a Sydney business, pretty much focused on soft plastics and B2G government. Now we are an Australian business collecting much more than soft plastics. The list is really long. Um, and we have three different segments, government, uh, as I said before, but as well as consumers and businesses. Yeah, I think that answers. What are the, the typical training background of your door-to-door -door collectors? Can they be anyone who's interested and passionate in the cause and just receive training or they need some experience in the industry beforehand? I can take this one before Eugenie calls me out. Um, so yeah, so we generally, we look for uh, drivers who are based in the areas of operation. So to keep the, the distance travel uh, the shortest possible. So that's point number one. Uh, once we find we don't need experience, obviously, we give you all the training. So they will go through, obviously, an initial interview. There is a training manual that they have to go through, a questionnaire, making sure. And then we also, once it's on board, like we uh, periodically uh, audit uh, drivers as well. Um, and then they also, when they come uh, back to the consolidation points um, as well, um, you know, if we need to address something, that's, that's what we do it as well. So that's, that's the training that, that we do for them. Thank you, Reiki. Who is the best person to talk about partnerships? Eugene, you were the one? So there's just an investor interested in a partnership. What is the best way to contact you? Yes, um, that will be me or Mikey on the team. Uh, so you can just uh, email me. I'll reply to the question directly in the Q&A. Um, and yes, please reach out. Thank you. Uh, Georgia, you mentioned on your presentation the gig economy, and we have a few questions asking what is that? What is the gig economy market? Very simply, it's the Uber market. It's people that want to work and be paid per task and not have a full-time job. So that's why we do not employ drivers full-time. We don't have trucks, but we're using people with their own car, which makes the, the model much nimbler and, uh, yeah, and less capital intensive than a normal waste company. Do you feel that there is a risk of the company growing too big and lose what it makes it so great currently? High risk, you know, becoming too big. <laughs> I'm sure it's a risk. 
a great problem to have. Yeah. But I feel that if you have the right people and the right processes in place, once you grow, you kind of keep the same culture, right? The same mindset. But that's the goal. Yeah. Who, with regarding to B2C, how you targeting the areas across Australia, there are weaker participants in recycling? That's an interesting question. We, at the moment, the way we um, choose the areas is more based on the operation size and how we want to be like in all the major cities in Australia. So we, we have not voluntarily targeted any areas that um, for the sole reason of them being um, not that willing in terms of recycling. Um, if anything, we might choose the opposite way. Um, but where we're in areas um, where it seems that people are not that willing, we'll just use the same strategy and try and explain the reason why um, you should be recycling these items um, and trying and make it in the, in the most engaging way possible. Yeah, well, thank you. Um... Robin is saying, just like to say, Recycles Mar has been a godsend for me for taking the soft plastics. Did you guys know that soft plastic would be such a big deal? It was kind of a pain point in the market before. Yes, definitely. It's a it's a very emotional, cringing topic. It's it's the one item that you come across the most often in your home and that can't go in your recycling bin. Yeah. Uh, Daniel, yes, you're going to have a prospectus available for the investment round. We call it the offer document, but essentially you're going to have all the information before you make a conscious decision. What about getting coals and woolies to pay Recycles Mart for collections of soft plastics? Uh, yeah, well, I can take this one. So coals and woolies are looking into different options. Um Eventually, I'm not sure it will make sense us doing it or them directly working with a processor in the uh, plastic space. But yeah, we, it was one of the many conversations we're having at the moment. Uh, we'll be clearing on the side for it. Cool. Uh, there are a question that obviously there is increasing number of people living in apartments and living back out will be a challenge for them. Is that something that you guys are experiencing and do you have a plan for that? Yes, 100%. Um, so we have a few plans, actually. Um, so one is our program for buildings um, that we have set up a few, a year ago, maybe, or um, 18 months ago. So um, for these um, programs to exist, we need to have a direct relationship with the building manager. So there needs to be a building manager there or a super user from the building. That's what happened as well in a few other situations. And then we can um, collect all in one go directly in the, in the bin room. Um, where they can set up a recycling station. It can be big or small. We've had um, buildings setting up bins of items we collect or buildings just setting these Kallax shelves on IKEA with little boxes um, and booking pickups whenever they need for the whole building. So that's one. Um, and then for the situations where there's no drive within the building or no building manager, um, we uh, um, or have implemented, um, thanks to our tech team, um, a feature where people can actually take a picture of the, the place where they leave their bag out. Um, but it will be definitely up to them to try and find a space where our drivers will safely pick up the, the bag and then and leave the bags back. Um, so yeah, we're trying to address it because we, we know like it's an important part of the population as well, um, living in, in dwelling units. Um, so yeah, that's what we've tried um, and we are always open to new suggestions. Thank you. Do the recycling partners pay for the materials or take them for free? Ricky. Yeah, I think that was um, a kind of answer before. So we have a, a bit of a mix depending on the on the items we collect. Some of them uh, we pay for, some of them we, they take it for free, and some of them they give us like little rebates for it. So that kind of it's kind of neutral at the end of the day. Beautiful. Uh, Edward, as a retail investor, you can invest up to $10,000 per company per year. After that, we need to be a sophisticated investor. I'm sending you some material. Any question, let us know. Are you looking to expand the team in the near, near future? And if so, in what areas? Do you want to take this about the team expansion? Yeah, so as I said before, we want to expand into uh, the last three missing areas, WA Tasmania and uh, um, ACT by August 1st. 
Can you describe your company work culture? Is it hectic, stressful to the employees? George, Absolutely you can answer that. Super chill. We just relax. No, I'm kidding. Uh, of course, no. it's a fast pace. Uh, you know, in company, we are a startup that is growing quite quickly, but that doesn't mean that we can have a great team culture. Uh, and maybe Eugenie, you can expand a little bit into this. Thank you. Um, yeah, so as George was mentioning, we are fast paced, but also um, very, all very passionate about the same cause. And that thing, I think that's what is bringing us together. Um, we work from different cities, um, and we just make sure that we actually see each other uh, once a year or sometimes even twice. Um, but the, the biggest bulk of the team is Sydney based. And so we go to the office um, a couple of times a week. Um, we uh, try and make sure that everyone feels connected um, and supported through our uh, regular standard meetings that happen every morning um, and through a monthly meeting that just brings everyone together to go through the results, um, challenges that we've uh, come across and the biggest uh, goals for the next period. Um, and I think this way so far, we've had quite a good uh, retention of our employees uh, with some dinosaurs like me being there for almost four years and some more recent recruits um, on the call as well. Um, but yes, I would say overall, it's a great um, culture for a um, young business. Beautiful. Eugenie, do you have speakers who will come and speak to the community groups? Uh, I'm assuming that is about recycling and sustainability. Yes, um, so we really try hard to make that happen whenever we can, but obviously we're a very, very lean team, so it's not always possible to have someone available. Uh, but we've had um, people were mainly in my team, uh, including me as well, and Marco is helping out as well um, to talk to communities. Uh, we've talked yeah, to different communities in the Sydney area. Uh, we've done lunch and learn with business partners like um, Google, for example, we work. So yes, whenever we can, we do it. Um, but again, that's not something that we can always do we wish we could do more um and zoom is actually a good technique for that we can we can always do it um remotely and we love doing it what do you think motivates the b2c customers to use the service as opposed to just throw the items in the red bin the feel-good vibe that comes when you get your uh, message, like your bags have been picked up, you've done good for the environment without really uh, going the extra mile. Um, I think that's that's something that really um, our customers enjoy. That's at least what they say when they reach out to us, which they actually do a lot. Anna said that you mentioned that you found other partners after the collapse of Red Cycle. She's asking if you're able to share who they are and how they can use them because she's in WA and you guys are not there yet. But I think- Yeah, we, they, they don't work B2B, B2C. They're very large companies based in Victoria. Um, and so now it's, I saw the questions. Uh, all we can say, Anna, is we're going to try to launch there as soon as possible so you can you can recycle your soft plastics. But it's a very large manufacturing plant. Like they don't take a single bag of soft plastics. They need trucks to make it work, you know, work for them. Beautiful. That's exactly what we do. You know, it's like connecting- Lots of small uh, individuals with a tiny bit of amount and providing a large truck that a uh, large facility can receive. Beautiful. Uh, Edwards, I just want to make a note about the team culture and the gig economy. From the driver's perspective, great culture. And some of us, myself included, use electric vehicles to make it even more sustainable. It's such a great feedback. You're the best employee I've ever seen. If you want to work for Birchill, let us know. <laughs> that brings us to the end of the webinar i hope this was helpful to everyone this was super insightful i work with these guys every day and i still learned a lot today so i hope this was like this for everyone any closing remarks from the team um well thank you everyone for uh coming over today it's been long it's been more than an hour so we really appreciate your time and uh, if you have any other questions, uh, please shoot me an email or call me anytime. And I'm always happy to chat. Yes, thank you so much for staying um, so long. Um, yes, and as everyone said, um, the expression of interest is still open. Um, so if you haven't done it yet, uh, click on that I'm interested button on the Virgil page. Um, and we are looking forward to yeah, answering more questions if you have or keeping in touch in the coming weeks. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.